Good evening, folks. Although, as you can see, it's afternoon for me, but uh, by the time you see this, it'll probably be evening. We would have loved to have be able to gather to uh, this evening and worship together, but uh, we just weren't logistically able to do so. Um, but I did have a little thought, something of a meditation from the Word of God that uh, I'd like to share with you to commemorate the, uh, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, our Lord, this Good Friday. And if you'll stick around to the end, we have a little musical celebration as well. So uh, tonight, as we commemorate the uh, crucifixion of Jesus, co-memorate, that is, we remember together. And uh, so as we remember Jesus' death together, I'd like for us to remember something else as well, something that comes to us from Numbers 21. Our, uh, our forefathers in the faith, the people of Israel, they had been being guided and cared for in the wilderness for about 40 years. Now, did you notice the way I worded that? We typically say they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, but they were, they were guided every step of the way. Um, they were provided for every step of the way. They had bread from heaven every morning. They had water, uh, bad water made good, water from a rock as they needed it. Sure, some of them, many of them, couldn't enter the promised land without dying first. Uh, their children could. So I'm not suggesting we ditch the description wandering in the wilderness. What I do want us to grasp, though, is that we're in exactly the same place that they are. Uh, at least most of us are. We've been delivered from bondage to sin and death. Uh, but throughout our lives, the faith that gives us life is tested and tried. You know, as we work through the book of Revelation on Sunday mornings, we've seen ourselves described as refugees, together with our mother, the church, refugees in the wilderness where we find nourishment in the place that the Lord has prepared for us. Now, if you grasp that, that we're in precisely the same position that they are, you'll easily understand what happens in our story. It's a story of discouragement or impatience, depending on which version you use, which translation you use. If, uh, if you have a copy of the scriptures, you might want to follow along. It's from Numbers 21, and I'll begin in verse 4. Numbers 21, 4. It says, from Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. Now, some translations say that they became discouraged. I don't really think there's a whole lot of difference between the two. One sounds more passive <clears throat> and one sounds more active. You know, the, uh, that is discouraged sounds... I don't know, dejected and sad, whereas impatient sounds antsy and ready to go. Um, the Hebrew word has to do with shortness. Someone might have a, a short temper, you know, short on tolerance. <laughs> or someone might come up short because they are short on endurance. So which is it here? Well, it's probably both. I mean... In the situation, uh, Miriam has just died, Aaron has just died, uh, Moses has just found out that, that he can't lead them into the promised land, and uh, when they asked the king of Edom to let them pass through on their way to the, to the land, taking nothing as they go, or buying, you know, at the, at the king of Edom's option, nope, the Edomites say no. But they're not Canaanites, they're relatives through Esau. And so as frustrating as it is, they couldn't go through. Now it's at just this point that they get attacked and cry out to God and are given victory. And the test is set up for us. Remember, we too are walking in this wilderness of this world. And I'm not spiritualizing when I say that. I'm using biblical language to describe the Christian walk. As one walked in the wilderness facing trial after trial in the pursuit of holiness on our way to the promised land. Now, for the fathers in the wilderness, the cloud has now moved. It's time to break camp, if you remember how they, they did things. Now... Now, my kids will tell you that um, 
I have no sense of north, south, east, or west. <clears throat> My sense of direction is pretty bad, but even I know that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, and these people live their whole lives under the sun, and so they know very well the direction that they're traveling, and it is backwards. They're going back toward the wilderness, back toward the Red Sea. So, discouraged, impatient, I'd say they were both. Look at verse 5. The, the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Oh, my. I mean, <clears throat> um... He brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. Most of you are dying because of your rebellion. He's given you water continuously. Your sandals haven't worn out. In fact, the last time you complained about water, Moses, you cost Moses his entry into the promised land. Wow. And do you see what they call God's bread from heaven? This great picture of God's provision. Jesus said that he is the, the fulfillment of, of this heavenly bread, and here they call it something something bad. It, it either means awful or it means meager, as in barely enough. But either one is a blasphemous insult. Can you identify with it, though? I mean, when we get to the end of our patience, when we find ourselves on the cusp of despair, we can say some pretty despicable things, can't we? And they often cost us as God disciplines us. And, and so it was with our forefathers. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And, just like us, they knew they needed to repent. Now, they recognized the Lord's discipline. How? From the serpents? No, not from the serpent snake bites alone but by their consciences working with those snake bites, recognizing in them a call to repentance. I say that because we all face hardships, and as Job discover, or as we discover as we read the book of Job, not all the hardships we face are a result of our sin, but every hardship that we face is an opportunity to grow in our faith. So our forefathers repented, verse 7, and the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the Lord. I prayed to the Lord for the people. Now, here's what happens next is picked up by Jesus in John chapter 3, but let's hear it from Numbers 21, verse 8. And the Lord said to Moses, <clears throat> Make a fiery serpent, and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Now, do you notice some of the core imagery of our story? I mean the whole story of redemption here. Uh, it, it was a serpent who led our first parents astray. Um, and, and that cost us life itself. Uh, the gospel is first described in terms of the defeat of a serpent. I will put enmity between you and, your, and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. It was the serpent that threatened Job, which is why the book ends the way it does. And here it's the fiery serpent. But, but what's fascinating is that it is the serpent that is affixed to the pole and lift it up. Why the serpent? I mean, the imagery is clear for us, I think, like, you know, where we stand in history, this side of the empty tomb, uh, when all these pictures make sense. So, so this clearly points to the crucifixion of Jesus, just as Jesus said it would when he was talking to Nicodemus in John 3. The, famous, the, the context of that famous verse, you know, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In the context of that verse, Jesus points to our passage in Numbers 21. 
He tells Nicodemus, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So there's an analogy then between the crucifixion and this lifting up of the serpent. So does it bother you that in the Old Testament picture of our redemption, instead of a spotless lamb on the post, it's the serpent? Here's how Paul explained it in Galatians 3. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that's what we're commemorating this evening, brothers and sisters. Christ bore the curse of sin. And so what do we look at when we look at the cross? We look at Satan's defeat. This is uh, the, the bruising or crushing of Satan's head. You know, God gave a picture way back in Numbers 21 of what he was going to do to save us. Now, they couldn't have known that God was going to send his own son uh, to live a spotless life and then lay down his, his uh, life and sacrifice for sin. Um, they couldn't have known that that would be the cure to the snake bite of sin. But in that picture that God gave us in Numbers 21, he pictured Satan's defeat. You know, after uh, Saul and Jonathan fell on Mount Gilboa, the Philistines came and were, were plundering uh, the slain, and they found him, and, and they, they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gil Gilboa, so they cut off his head and stripped off his armor and sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to carry the good news to the house of their idols and their people. It's like an anti-gospel. And they put his armor in the temple of Ashtoreth and they fastened his body to the wall of Beit Shan. See, they hung his body as a trophy of war and the men of Jabesh Gilead in a great act of faithfulness went and took it down. So putting the dead body of your enemy on the wall or on a tree, or in our case, on the cross, it's a statement of triumph and disdain. And when Jesus died upon that cross, he, the righteous one, the Son of God, sent to reveal the Father's true character to us, and having lived a perfect life before us, became a curse for us. He himself took on all the guilt and stain of every sin that any and all of his sheep would ever commit in the past, present, or future. He took them upon himself. And so when he was on the cross, so was your sin. And that's ugly, isn't it? And so we look upon the cross as a statement of triumph and disdain. Our Lord's triumph and his disdain of all of our sin. And we're to join him in seeing that cost. You know, in, in Psalm 73, the psalmist almost envied the wicked. He almost felt, let his heart fall into discontent and discouragement and impatience. And then he went to the temple and he saw the outcome of the wicked and it cured him as he saw them slain on the altar. Well, the wages of sin are displayed for us on the cross, even as it was displayed for them in the wilderness. It's not an image of a live snake that they put on the pole. <laughs> It's, the, it's lifting up in victory of a corpse. But it's also the mystery of grace that is displayed on the cross and is displayed in the, on that pole in the wilderness. The victory would be won. The cure would be found not by human effort, but by God's provision alone. And all that would be required of us would be to look to it, to look for his healing. 
How many times did God say throughout the ages, be still and know that I am God? Just sit back and watch as I destroy your enemies. Or do this seemingly meaningless thing as I give you the victory. It's just our God's style. That's his M.O., if you will. And the book of Job ends with God describing the power of the serpent as being too powerful for men to, to handle. And that's the point, is that he would win the victory. And the implication for Job, and this is where it ties in for us this evening, is just because you don't understand why God has you going in the direction you're going in now, don't think that you're necessarily headed the wrong way. That is, don't complain about God's custom-tailored discipleship program for you. See, that's what Job was doing. And that's what our forefathers in the wilderness were doing too, isn't it? The cloud's going the wrong way. No, it isn't. Now, do you notice that these are not new sheep in God's pen? These people have been following God and seeing his provision for nearly 40 years, or if they're young, for their whole lives. And yet it's only here that, that we get this greatest picture of the cross. I mean, I'm not saying the Exodus doesn't picture the cross. Of course it does. But this is a full and explicit picture of what God was going to do to win the victory. And, and these people get it so far into their walk. And my point in drawing that to your attention, brothers and sisters, is that you may need to look at the cross again. Paul tells us to walk in Jesus in the same way that we received Jesus. How was that? By faith. Look to Jesus and live. You know, we are so easily discouraged. I mean, don't misunderstand. I'm not making light of the hardships that, that we've faced over the last couple of years. But we know in our heart of hearts, we know that God is faithful. But we're so easily frustrated by our circumstances and we get discouraged or, or we get impatient. They, they both spring from the same salty well. And so we grumble, we do. And we're discontented, aren't we? At least sometimes. Well, brothers and sisters, what I hope you grasp from our passage is this is no minor matter for your soul. Don't you see how perfectly this, this pa ca passage captures the, the whole story of our redemption? Adam and Eve were not content with God's plan for them. And it cost us life itself. Our forefathers in the wilderness, they weren't content with God's manna or water or guidance. And so fiery serpents took their lives. But God would crush the serpent and win the victory. And healing would be found in the celebration of that victory as that serpent was li lifted on a pole. It, it's in that sense that we proclaim the Lord's death every time we share the Lord's Supper because we, we're celebrating it, because we cling to it, because it's in his death that we find our life. So what I'd like you to ponder, or I'd invite you to ponder this weekend as you prepare to celebrate the resurrection on Sunday morning, the crowning victory over our enemy, is how central contentment is to walking with Christ. As Paul tells Timothy, godliness with contentment is great gain. Contentment goes to the heart of faith, doesn't it? You know, I can pretty well assure you that when folks were being bitten by these fiery serpents, they weren't worried about their bellies anymore. They weren't concerned about the, the bread, whether it was just enough or didn't suit their tastes. They weren't worried about water. They were worried about life. And I'm confident that no matter who you are, if you're still breathing and confessing your faith in Christ Jesus, then you're still in his 
classroom, you're still facing trials as he's perfecting you. And so ask yourself whether you are finding contentment in the way or whether you're straying from God's path or bucking against his discipline and finding discontentment in his path. So let me close with Colossians 2, 6. As you received Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk in him. Just trust him. The way of the world, the way of your flesh, the, the way of sin, it's fruitless and it leads to shame and death. And you know this. So turn from sin and cling to the forgiveness and the healing that is provided for us on the cross. Will you pray with me? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for sending your Son. And Lord Jesus, thank you for coming. Thank you for revealing your Father in truth to us. And thank you for purchasing our adoption. That we might not only be son, you know, servants of our God, that he might not just be our God and our judge, but that he might be our father, that we might be sons. So thank you, Jesus, for the cross. We ask that you'd give us perspective, Lord, and patience. By your Holy Spirit, Lord, give us long-suffering endurance and give us contentment in your lordship and in your provision, your guidance Teach us to live in the hope of our inheritance, eternal life with you. Renew, Lord, our appreciation for the gospel and our affection for you. We ask these things for the sake of Jesus. So by your spirit, Lord, make it so. For we ask it in Jesus' name. I was running out of time.
thank you guys for joining us. We'll see you Sunday morning.